Today, it is a pleasure to welcome Victor Cha back to this podium. Professor Cha is currently the DS Song Korea Foundation Chair in Government and the Director of Asian Studies at Georgetown University. He also serves as Senior Advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Professor Cha will be talking to us today about his new book, Power Play, in which he investigates the origin of American alliances in Asia how the system has changed over time, and what must be done to navigate a complex new era of international security. It really is a pleasure to be here, um, uh, and it's a pleasure to talk to you about um, uh, this book this morning, Power Play, uh, The Origins of the American Alliance System in Asia. Um, <clears throat> there are probably a uh, number of you in this audience that have written books as well, and you know that uh, every book is a story, but uh, there is a story behind every book. Um, and in this case, uh, for me, the story behind this book was that um, I was uh, teaching a course at Georgetown in uh, East Asian security. And I was at the lecture when we were talking about differences between Asia and Europe. Right? And in particular, why it was that Asia didn't have a NATO like Europe. And so, um, you know, this is a class of about uh, 70 students. And so I was going through all of the reasons, um, as I had done every, every year when I taught this course, about why Asia didn't have a NATO. Um, and so I mentioned geography. In the European theater, uh, essentially you had a contiguous land theater with a clear dividing line down the middle. Right, much more conducive to a NATO-type organization, a collective defense organization. In Asia, you had a different geography. You had continental, but you also had maritime. It was a real mix, right? So it's harder. You know, it's harder to develop a single sort of umbrella organization. Then I moved on and I talked about uh, polarity, right? Great power polarity. In, in Europe, you had a contiguous land theater and you had two poles. Right, the United States and the Soviet Union. In Asia, you also had a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, but you also, this was complicated by a third pole, right, and that was China. Right, and so that made it harder to sort of form two completely uh, uh, separate organizations. Um, then I talked about economic interdependence, right, uh, the idea being that even in Europe after World War II, the level of economic interaction, trade, and investment among the countries in Europe was still fairly high. Europe was still fairly integrated. Right? And that's conducive to creating a community. In Asia after World War II, there was almost no trade within the region. Right? If anything, the trade was going outside the region. And then the last thing I mentioned in the class uh, as I was finishing this part of the lecture was I said, and then the other thing we also have to consider is race. Right, race. Because in Europe, it was very easy for planners to sit down and think about planning the post-war reconstruction of Europe and the security of Europe with other uh, um, uh, Europeans, right? the French, the British. Uh, you know, we could have these conversations you know, around a nice table with coffee and wine and all this other stuff. In Asia, it was diff more difficult to imagine that right? because they were at a lower level of development a lower level of education, it was hard to imagine forming sort of this, this grouping, right, where we'd all sit around the table and talk to each other as equals. Right, so I was going through all of these reasons, and as I'm going through these reasons, a student walks into class late, right? And this student is late for class every week, right? Uh, and he looks like he just rolled out of bed. And the class met, I think, at like 11.30 in the morning. <laughs> but still, he just looked like he just rolled out of bed and sort of shuffles into the back of the classroom and sits there. And I think on this, for this particular lecture, I think he noticed that I noticed that he was late. And so at the end of class, as the students were filing out, he kind of shuffles down to the front of the classroom and he says, um, 
Professor Chow, I want to ask you a question. And I said, sure, what is it? And he said, um, so why, I don't understand why the United States chose this bilateral alliance system in Asia, and it chose this collective defense system in Europe. And I looked at him and I said, I just spent half the lecture talking about that. Right? I said, you know, geography, polarity, economic interdependence, these sorts of things. And, um, you know, I think he was just trying to show that he had an interest in the class. And then he was like, oh, okay, all right, I got it. Thanks, thanks a lot, Professor. And, um, and so he, you know, scurried out of the classroom, probably to go back to sleep. Right? <laughs> but then as I was walking back to my office, I was thinking about his question, because whenever students ask questions, you answer them. But I always think about the questions that they ask. And I thought it was an interesting question, because he was asking about choice. Right? I had given a bunch of explanations about structure right? that had to do with geography, had to do with great balance of power, right? had to do with economic interest. And he was asking me a very human question about choice. Why did the United States choose to organize security in Europe one way and to organize security in Asia another way? And when I thought about it, I thought, this is actually a great question. Right? Because none of the literature has really addressed this. They've talked about all the things that I lectured about, but no one's really asked the question of choice, volition. Why did you know, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, George Kennan, Dean Acheson, why did they choose a bilateral alliance system for Asia? Why was the US security design of architecture in Asia different from Europe? Why was there NATO in Europe? Why were there the bilateral so-called hub and spokes system in Asia. It's called hub and spokes because think of a bicycle wheel, you have a hub, right? That's the great power. And then you have spokes, which are each of the bilateral alliance relationships that the United States created in the region with not much interaction among the spokes, right? So that's what we mean when we say hub and spokes. Why did the United States choose a multilateral design for Europe and a bilateral design for Asia? Why did we choose an inclusive design for Europe, right? this big, large umbrella collective defense system? Um, but why did we choose an exclusive security design for Asia? Why did we choose to apportion security exclusively in Asia while we saw it as inclusive in Europe? And in the end, my answer is, it is the title of the book, my answer is the, what I call the power play, which is that the United States had to develop a different strategy for Asia because it saw a very unique situation in Asia at the end of the Second World War and at the beginning of the Cold War. And um, the best way to sort of encapsulate this is uh, what, what the United States had to contend with was a combination of dangerous partners right, and new or different strategic beliefs. And let me start with the dangerous partners. So this was the beginning of the Cold War, and the United States wanted to have strongly anti-communist leaders in these countries in Asia. And it had found two in uh, uh, Formosa, or Taiwan, right, and in Korea, right? Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan, and Sung Man Rhee in Korea. Great anti-communists, right? Fantastic anti-communists. But these were also two leaders who had some problems. Right? For one, both of them, their domestic political legi legitimacy was questionable right? because you know, they kind of ruled in both countries with a pretty strong hand. Right? Um, two, both of these leaders, Chiang Kai-shek and Sun Man Rhee, were, while they were fighting the Cold War, they were both embroiled in their own civil wars. Right? Chiang Kai-shek wanted to take back mainland China, and Sung Man Rhee wanted to take back the Korean Peninsula. Um, and so for both of them, essentially you had two anti-communist allies that were embroiled in their own civil wars and had revisionist intentions, a revisionist agenda. They wanted to change the status quo. For Chiang Kai-shek, he was very provocative, right, in terms of his announced plans to take back the mainland. Um, he funded guerrilla troops in Burma that would con con constantly sort of do raids into China. Uh, he stationed troops on the offshore islands, 
uh, as a way to, again, to try to take action against mainland China. In South Korea, Sung Man Rhee had a very open policy of so-called marching north, that he was going to march north and retake uh, the Korean Peninsula. Um, and so what this created for the United States was a bit of a dilemma, because you had these great anti-communist allies, the kinds that you would want in what was emerging as a real Cold War, uh, but at the same time, ones that looked like they were willing and ready to try to draw the United States into a war on the Asian mainland. Right? Eisenhower, talk, I, so I did a lot of archival research for this book, Eisenhower in meetings uh, at the White House in the State Department talked openly about his concern that Chiang Kai-shek wanted to pull the United States into a nuclear war with mainland China. Um, so this, so that, that was one. That, that was one thing they had to deal with. The other was um, uh, what, what I was saying was sort of these strategic beliefs, and the main change there was the growth, or sort of the embedding of the domino theory in the way that we thought about uh, security around the world, and it was what led the United States to connect the periphery with the core. Right, it was part of the reason that we fought in Korea and part of the reason that we fought in Vietnam. So the domino theory, this notion that the core and the periphery were now connected, right, was something. It really didn't emerge in US thinking after the revolution in China in 1949. I mean, it was there, but it wasn't really in US strategic thinking in 1949. But after the Korean War, right, after the North Koreans invaded um, in June of 1950, then the domino theory really started to emerge in terms of um, US uh, Cold War thinking. And so what the domino theory meant was that it, it created another dilemma for the United States, because if you have a partner that you think is going to drag you into something that you don't necessarily want to be involved in, your natural reaction is to pull back, right? to not support. And so they had that concern about countries like uh, 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 Taiwan and Korea. The problem was, because of the domino theory, you could not pull back. Right? Because of the domino theory, if these partners got themselves into trouble, you were obligated to go help them because you were worried if one of them tipped, they'd all start tipping. Right? So this was the dilemma that the United States faced in Asia. Arguably, it was not the dilemma that they faced in Europe. Um, and so what I argue in the book is that you know, in thinking about this, right, Truman and Eisenhower, Ken and Atchison, in thinking about this, they made the decision eventually to not to distance from these dangerous or potentially rogue partners, but to double down, right, to double down. Um, and that is uh, to make a commitment to defend them in the Cold War, but also to place a premium on not just defending them, but controlling them controlling them, and control was best exercised through establishing a deep bilateral tie with these countries rather than creating some, some sort of multilateral mechanism. Right? If you want to exercise control, the best way to do it is individually. Right? Rather than putting it to a committee vote, you want to establish a deep tie with political, economic, military assistance, create dependency, Right? and then be able to titrate that assistance in order every time it looked like these, these allies might go rogue, right? they might do something different. So in the book I talk about the front end and the back end of the power play. The front end of the power play is basic alliances. I mean, this is what the alliances were for, to defend these countries against communist aggression, right? the application of the Truman Doctrine to Asia, that's what it was. But what I really focus on in the book is the back end of the power play, which is the, uh, the use of these alliances, right? the creation of these ties, and then the use of these alliances to control the, these partners. And, um, and again, there's a lot of archival research in the book uh, where um, you know, there, there are very explicit examples of sort of Eisenhower saying, all right, we're not going to approve this shipment of planes to Chiang Kai-shek until he promises to stop funding the guerrillas in Burma. Right? I mean, there's very clear examples of trying to exercise, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully, 
um, these sorts of things. So there was a clear US preference for bilateralism in Asia. And um, there were proposals by, at various times in history, by um, uh, Sung Man Ri in Korea, by Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan, by Quirino in the Philippines for some sort of Asian NATO. Right? There had been proposals made. And the US expressed preference for bilateralism was manifested in the way we were very um, unenthusiastic about those proposals, right? about trying to create some sort of multilateral mechanism, because uh, uh, that would not serve the purpose of what uh, we were interested in. So that's Taiwan and Korea. What about Japan? The power play for Japan was very different, because there was not a concern that there was a leader in Japan that, that was embroiled in a civil war or that was seeking to retake something, right? There wasn't the same uh, sort of con concern. But there still was a great deal of American preoccupation with control. Right? Japan, um, as George Kennan said, when he started looking at Asia for the first time after World War II, Japan was the only great power in Asia. And for the foreseeable future, it would be the only great power in Asia. The United States orientation towards Asia prior to the Korean War, the United States orientation toward Asia was largely maritime, right? We are a maritime power in Asia. We didn't see ourselves as a continental power in Asia. And if we were going to be a maritime power in Asia, the most important country was Japan, right? Australia was important, New Zealand was important, Philippines was, were, were important, and Indonesia, but the key country was Japan. So um, the United States strategy with regard to Japan, as Kennan wrote in a policy planning memo, was we had to win Japan. Right? We had to win Japan. We had to turn Japan into the Britain of Asia. And so um, the, uh, um, the only way to do that was to exercise control. Now, um, there was a brief period of time in which the United States thought about a similar model for Japan as had been done in Germany, which was to create a deep bilateral tie and then try to embed that in some sort of broader grouping of states. Um, <clears throat> but there's a trip that John Foster Dulles, at this point he was now Secretary of State, makes to the region in February of 1952, in which he goes to countries in the region. And he talks to the Australians and says, you know, what about this idea of putting Japan in a grouping of maritime states in Asia? And the Australians said, no thank you. Um, we don't trust Japan, we still fear Japan. We would much prefer that the United States have a deep bilateral tie and have its thumb on Japan um, uh, during this sort of re reconstruction, reverse course of the occupation period. The Kiwis came to Australia, I think. And same thing, right? They felt the same way. Went to Japan, Japan felt the same way, right? Japan did not want to be part of multilateral grouping because they said nobody trusts us and everybody fears us. We want a bilateral alliance with Japan. So in the end, um, um, after Dulles takes that trip and he comes back and he's giving talks here, I don't know if he gave one here, but he gave one at, I think, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and if you read the transcript of the speech, his thinking very much is focused on creating this bilateral mechanism uh, in Asia. And, and so for this reason, this emphasis on you know, the, the dilemma, the unique situation that they saw in Asia and the dilemmas that they faced forced them to choose this particular framework for Asia. Um, and to this day, it is the most deeply imprinted part of, this, of the political architecture in Asia today is the United States bilateral hub and spoke system. And it has legacies that continue until this day, right? I think it is, many academics have argued, and I think it's fair to argue, that part of the reason, up until fairly recently, that Asia, and so now I'm moving to the present here, okay, um, that Asia is under-institutionalized relative to Europe, part of the reason is because of the deep imprint of the US bilateral system in Asia. Right? That's why Asia, relatively speaking, has been under-institutionalized. Because the United States created this arrangement, all the countries in the region after decolonization and the end of the Cold War really had no incentive to engage with each other because they all got what they wanted from the United States. Similarly, Japan, right? There is, as many of you know, this longstanding issue of unresolved history between Japan and the region. 
part of that is a legacy of the bilateral hub and spoke system because Japan, again, also had no real incentives to reconcile with the region. It got everything it wanted from, um, uh, from the United States. So it's a very deep imprint. So what does this all mean for today? Um, we've seen a couple of things happen. So after the end of the Cold War, what we see is a, a um, sort of plurilateralization of the bilateral alliance structure. So what that means is if before we had line segments, the US-Japan alliance, the US-Korea alliance, the US-Philippines alliance, right? Before we had line segments, after the Cold War, we start seeing different geometric shapes, right? We start seeing triangles, quadrilaterals, these sorts of things. Not just US-Japan, but US-Japan-Australia, US-Japan-Korea, right? Quadrilateral arrangements that start to emerge based on the bilateral alliance system, largely to deal with functional issues, disaster uh, uh, response to the 2004 tsunami, the six party talks to deal with North Korea nuclear weapons, right? We start seeing sort of this plurilateralization of the bilateral line structure. The second set of institutions we see growing out of Asia is after the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98. We start seeing newer institutions in Asia, uh, more indigenous to the region, largely based around ASEAN, right, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, in response to the Asian financial crisis. So in addition to ASEAN, we see things like ASEAN Plus Three, ASEAN Regional Forum, right, Chiang Mai Initiative, all these different sorts of things, largely centered around Southeast Asia. And then perhaps the, our, um, the innovation that has created the most discussion and debate has been, happened in the last decade, right, which has been the growth of new institutions in Asia, largely centered around China. Right? These are things like the, the Asia, uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, right, SICA, RCEP, right, these are largely China-based institutions. And so the question is, with the growth of all these new institutions, are they all competing with each other now, right? There are people who talk about what uh, institutional balancing, right, between these institutions China's developing and the existing alliance system. Uh, as China built, as China has created the, these institutions, it's also been fairly clear about how it does not like the U.S. hub and spokes architecture. Right? China has tried to delegitimize the alliance system, calling for a new form of security in Asia, um, calling the U.S. alliance system selfish because it's an exclusive security arrangement. Right? It's a partnership. It's not inclusive, uh, and even referring to them as Cold War dinosaurs things that are from the Cold War uh, era. So the whole question is whether we have a zero-sum view of all this architecture developing in Asia um, and whether, uh, where it's all headed. And I'll just give you my opinion on this, which is I don't think that uh, this is zero-sum. Um, I think that what is emerging in Asia is not a choice of whether you need to be a part of US institutions or Chinese institutions. Uh, it's not a matter of choice, but it is a, what I call a complex patchwork of partially overlapping, parallel, sometimes interlinked structures in which there is no hierarchy among them. Right? Um, and this is very messy. Right? This is not the European Union. This is much messier than what we see in Europe. But in Asia, the messiness may be a good thing. Um, this is a region of changing power, of different regime types. You have everything from advanced industrialized democracies like Japan and Korea to countries that are rolling back from democracy like Russia to uh, countries right on the cusp like Vietnam to countries like North Korea, right? total dictatorships. So we have all these different regime types, changing power differentials, unresolved history. And in these sorts of situations, as some regime theorists will tell you, complexity may actually be a good thing. Right? Complexity, messiness may be a good thing because it may help to mute the security dilemmas or insecurity spirals that might exist if we were to simply create one single hierarchical uh, organization. Right? If it's messy, mitigates the membership problems, the exclusivity problems, um, it allows countries to forum shop, which is like 
you know, I have this issue, I want to see if I can work with this group, they say no, so then let me try this group, let me try this group, right? Um, if you're not a member of this organization, like if you're not a member of this table, right, you can be a member of this table because some people from this table will be part of this table. So there's a lot of overlapping and messiness about what's happening in Asia that um, is not necessarily a bad thing. Is it efficient? It is not efficient. Right? It is not efficient. But to create a single hierarchical arrangement will incite more problems, right? Uh, more competition than it would to sort of allow this thing to happen or grow as it is now. So um, um, in the, at the end of the book, I say, you know, in the end, what we all want is peace. Uh, and peace is not necessarily something that can be manufactured based on the way it worked in another region. And so we have to accept what's growing in Asia as being organic. And while there may be some competition that takes place, in the end, the complexity of Asia's architecture is, is the architecture of Asia. Uh, and we should not try to make it something that it's not, uh, because thus far, it's helped to promote peace and prosperity in the region. So with that, um, uh, thank you for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.